Welcome to Between the Covers, the show for readers and writers and lovers of books. I'm Stephanie, and I'm a publisher at Red Penguin Books, where we publish books of all types and genres. So whether you have a manuscript all ready to go, a book still stuck in your head, or maybe even 200 sheets of loose leaf shoved in a drawer, visit us at redpenguinbooks.com and unleash your inner author. I'm so excited today to be joined by three authors who have undoubtedly unleashed themselves. Phil Asmundson is the author of The Four Forces. This happens to be book two in the To Our Turns trilogy. So we know there's plenty of other books in Phil. Deborah Jarvis is the author of The Crystal Pawn, book one of the Kirathlian Chronicles. And then finally, Lindsay Kinsella is the author of The Lazarus Taxa. So I'm so excited to meet all three of our authors today. But first, we're going to meet Phil Asmundson. And our author writes, Alexa's birthday gifts weren't typical, a prophetic destiny and untold superpowers. Now she feels like the world rests on her shoulders. And it does. Saving it drew a target on her back. How does she protect the ones she loves and save the universe from destruction? Now her training takes her and her friends to creatures and worlds previously thought of only as mythological. If she fails in her training and her quest, more than her species is at risk. Can she and her loyal crew find and defeat the powerful weapons protecting the four forces and reunite them in time to save the universe. You'll love this second book in the sci-fi fantasy coming of age saga because the action continues with each turn of the page. Take a wormhole to the adventure today. And please help me in welcoming Phil Asmundson. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me today. Thanks. And, and Phil, where are you today, geographically speaking? I'm in Arizona, where, where the first and second book, well, the first book takes place here. Okay, the first book takes place in Arizona. Uh, I'm guessing the second book is not where I am in New York. <laughs> no, it takes place in uh, really unexplored areas around the Earth, such as what lies under the Antarctic ice cap and Ooh. what lies in the deepest depths of the oceans, places like that where she discovers, you know, her as you said, some of her superpowers in very strange environments. Fantastic. And in Arizona, are you in the part that's, you know, 110 degrees? Or are you in the part that it's snowing? I'm in, I'm in Tucson, or just okay. north of Tucson. It's a little cooler than Phoenix. You got to remember, Arizona is shaped like a bowl. Phoenix is at the bottom of the bowl. Right, right. Well, that's why, you know, uh, northern Arizona, where, you know, it's closed for the winter because of the elevation. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I, I am a huge Arizona fan. I love that part of the country. It's just so beautiful. So tell us a little bit about this uh, series and what got you started on it. How, how did you find the inspiration? Were you diving well, underneath the Antarctic or something? Uh, no, no. I, I've always liked uh, to write. And I dabbled in it. I did lots of little stories, mostly for my kids and friends. Um, but uh, Oh, gosh, back around uh, 2009, I stumbled upon this Native American myth called the Tartans. And it, it really just helps people explain some of the phenomena that are in Arizona, like Camelback Mountain has a specific reason for being there, and the, the superstitious mountains. But I fell in love with the Tartans because they were described as the little people of the Valley of the Sun. So they're only about three feet tall. So I decided I wanted to make them really powerful and from a distant planet and they were here on earth for a specific reason and it just kind of spawned from there oh i love that you know so many people will say to me i would love to start writing but i don't have any ideas and i love that yours came from mythology from native american mythology a story that you might have heard and and suddenly got intrigued on and wanted wanted the whole backstory well you certainly live in the right part of the country for that well, yeah, I discovered in all my searches that in Arizona has more myths than any other state in, in the United States. So this is one of thousands. If somebody wants to write, there's plenty more to go from. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I have a real love of science and um, uh, I wanted to have a, uh, a 16 year old girl as my protagonist because um, I, I, I was in the technology business and science and um, I, I saw a real lack of women represented in STEM. 
And so part of my initiative here was to try to get more women involved or exposed to science because science can be very daunting. It's very uh, intimidating, lots of very hard formulas. But in reality, when you break through it all, it's, it, it's really quite elegant and beautiful. I have a saying I like to use. I say science in its purest form is indistinguishable from magic, but infinitely more powerful. And that's what Alexa discovers as she starts to learn about the world around her in a very different view. She stops looking at it the way most of us do. We walk around and we take the sun coming up every morning and setting every evening, you know, as a given. But that that little uh, big ball of gas up in the sky is is, is really a phenomenon that has oh I don't know about a uh, um, hundred trillion uh, uh, siblings somewhere in this universe. Wow. When you say it like that, you all want to become scientists, don't we? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's you, know, you know, for me, I stuck my toe into science and I, I actually had a minor in physics and geology. I, I, I was uh, monitoring Mount St. Helens at the University of Oregon when it exploded. So, uh, you know, stuff like that, when you see it, and fortunately I was not there. I, I had a <laughs> warm in my house telling, it, telling me it went off. But uh, uh, when you start to see the power of nature, it, it really... Um, really captivates you. And so Alexa's journey really starts when her father who disappeared 12 years ago, he was a treasure hunter. Um, there are lots of treasure myths in the state of Arizona, uh, suddenly disappeared and no sign of him. And 12 years of the day he returns with no knowledge of her. So it's, you know, it upsets her obviously, um, but she starts to look into where he was to try to unravel his mystery. And in the process, it leads her to the Tartans because he had in fact been with the Tartans on their planet um, um, uh, which is called Yendola, uh, and they brought him back for very specific reasons because he had changed them. He had given them a gift that caused them to start to change, and that's part of the problem in the story. She has to do something to fix that, and at the same time, do something that will help fix the universe, which has fallen out of balance. Wow. So you you were inspired with the, the Torah in 2019. Mm-hmm. And it's now 2022, and you have, I mean, at least two books written already. Are there, are there more? All, all three are done and, and published. <laughs> In three years? Um, well, I wrote them over uh, a period of time. I was still working when I thought of this, and I just thought of it, and I kind of wrote what I would call the back cover of the story at first. Okay. And then I looked at it for like nine months. And um, in my <laughs> job, I, I traveled all over the world. I, I was a global uh, partner for Deloitte and Touche, and I, I led the technology media and telecom practice. So I was all over, I had about 9 million miles on airplanes. So it was on those long overseas flights coming back or going there that I started writing this thing. And I probably spent four or five years just kind of creating the overall story, but there'd be six month periods where I just walk away from it. I got too busy. I had, I had other things to do. I have seven grandchildren and three children. So there's a lot of family demand. And, uh, uh, but once I retired, that's when I really sat down. That was in 2014. I took a year just to do nothing, but I went to Iceland for a long time because I wanted to catch up with my relatives. And then uh, um, uh, I came back and I, I sat down to really write it. And uh, um, I had it edited by a professional editor and I really learned I had no idea how to write whatsoever. Uh, so, but, you know, with, with, with dedication to it, I, I, I really um, buckled down and, and uh, found that I... I became not only a good writer, uh, but the problem with becoming a writer is I can't read another book without editing it at the same time. So <laughs> it's really my ability to read, uh, but it's been, a, it's been a glorious journey and, and it was really fun, you know, to kind of cap it up. I mean, the, what she has to learn to do is to control the four forces of the universe. And these are real, they're not made up. And, you know, some people say, oh, is that earth, wind, fire? No, those are elements. And, you know, they're, 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 they're not that important. The four are gravity, the electromagnetic force, um, the strong force, and the weak force. And without those four forces, literally nothing would exist in the universe at all. Um, because they create every element that, that exists, that creates us. In fact, it might shock you to find out, but your entire existence and everything in your body was born from or was created in a dying star because it didn't exist in nature. And it actually only can exist in the core of stars. And when they die, they go through something called supernova. And so you know, that, that, that developed or sent all these elements that are now on earth. And that's why sometimes your rare earth elements 
those are very rare ones and they tend to be in stars much further away from us. That's why they're so rare here on this planet. Wow, unbelievable. And boy, you're just teaching us how to do retirement right, Phil, I gotta tell you. <laughs> Well, you know, I hope that kids can get excited about science because it really is fascinating. Um, you know, I was a I was a fan of Harry Potter. I love I, I love all books. I, I read tons of books, even though I edit them now. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I looked at Harry Potter. So this is really great. But waving a stick and having something happen, you know, that's just not realistic. Most of the things she does, if she could control those forces, is exactly what would happen. Wow! It's it's because that's what nature does, and so. Uh, it's fun to watch a very shy girl of 16 whose her biggest concern is life is her straight A average in school, <laughs> suddenly having to become literally the most powerful being in the universe. Well, I love that you deliberately chose as you were fleshing out your storyline and whatnot for it to be a 16 year old girl to empower not just your protagonist there, but uh, teen girls and, and young women everywhere to go into science. I think that was a, a great plus there as your, your whole storyline was formulating. Absolutely. I have five granddaughters and I have, I have uh, uh, two daughters. So, you know, I'd probably get yelled at if I made it a guy. <laughs> well, I hope they all read the book. That's yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. I'm thrilled to hear that they all read the book. And, and I, I hope that we're gonna hear more from you, uh, whether or not there are young women that are involved in the book. So thank you for that. Our next author, Deborah Jarvis, is the author of The Crystal Pawn, which is book one of her series. And our author writes, Deidre Hawes had never thought of her life as extraordinary until one day she met the father she never knew and thus began the adventure of a lifetime. Armed with only with the knowledge that she is heir to magical gifts that would allow her to call on the aid of the long vanished dragons. She finds herself drawn into a web of intrigue and murder where the powers behind the throne are aligning to make sure she doesn't succeed, no matter the cost. Deirdre soon finds her life in the hands of those she'd been told not to trust but trust them she must if she is to have any hope of not only completing her quest, but surviving to make the journey home. Together with several loyal friends, she makes her way south. As they travel further, she discovers that not everyone is as they seem and that preconceived notions of what is good and what is evil are often mere simplifications of a much more complex truth. When forces long allied with the crown begin to show their true intentions, it is up to Deirdre and her companions to figure out a way to evade their traps and make their way below the Southern mountains and across the desert to the jungle where the dragons are said to reside. Please welcome author Deborah Jarvis. Thanks Hi. so much for joining me. Oh, thank you for inviting me on today. Oh, absolutely. And and Deborah, where were you today? Beyond the Southern Mountains or someplace? Uh, yeah, I wish. Um, I'm up in New Hampshire. It's pretty good today. <laughs> it's pretty not good quite, today. But did, not quite 80, but it's going to be 90 this weekend. So not quite looking forward to that. No way. 90 degrees in New Hampshire. That's Oh, a yeah. That, that's common in the summertime. You do get really? that a lot. Yeah. So you're not up in the mountains? You're, you're No, I'm on the Massachusetts border. So we're pretty close to, to right the southern, the northern part of Mass. I, or as you say in your book, the southern mountains. <laughs> <laughs> pretty close, yeah. So, so tell me a little bit about the inspiration behind this. And, and am I saying this correctly? The Kirathian? Uh, yeah, it's a little bit tougher than that. It's Kirathian. Kirathian, okay. Yep, so Kirathian. Kirathian Chronicles. Um, so it's something that's been in the works for a long time. And I think I really, it got, has its bones back when I was in my teenage years. Um, and it started to come together as a story in my 20s. And then because of circumstances, divorce, and having to figure out what I was going to do with my life and going into the teaching field and uh, trying to get all that straightened out and figure out what I was doing, I ended up putting it aside for quite a while um, and finally came back to it in 2020. Of course, you know, I'm teaching from home at that point, along with a lot of other people. And I said, well, you know, this is, this is the opportunity to actually have time 
to work on the story um, and to, to start putting it together. So the first one is done. The second one came out in April and we're, we're starting work on the third one this summer. Fantastic, fantastic. Oh, a pandemic writer. I love that. <laughs> you know, so, so much uh, wonderful creativity happened during the lockdown, which is fabulous. You, this initial story dates back to, you know, when you were a kid, practically. We're talking the 80s. Yeah, it dates back to the 80s. Um, and I can look back and say, well, I know a lot of the inspiration came from writers like Peter S. Beagle, uh, a little bit of C.S. Lewis, and a number of other authors that were prominent at the time in the 80s. So I can kind of trace some of the bones back, but it definitely is its own story and it's moved into its own, it's got its own mythology, it's got its own background now. So it's come a long way. Now you mentioned you're a teacher, a uh, creative yes. writing teacher or something else? Um, I'm teaching creative writing this summer for one of the colleges I work with, but I generally teach high school uh, in New Hampshire, so. Okay, okay. Is this your, your first foray into novels? Uh, it is, yes. Wow, oh, fantastic. And this is book one. How, yes. how many books and, and how far along are we? Um, there are three. We've got two out now. The third one, as I said, I'm going to be working on this summer and hopefully right. we'll have out by next summer is the plan. Now, when you started this, or maybe even when you were younger and you had the first inkling, did you know it was going to be three books? Did you just have the little storyline or did it just kind of grow and grow and grow? It, uh, well, it ended up, that it was originally one book. And when I started looking into publishing it quite some years ago, I said, okay, what's the standard length for a fantasy novel? And it was somewhere around, you know, 90,000 words to 120,000 words. And I said, okay, this is, uh, you know, somewhere closer to, you know, 300, 400 pages, 500 pages. I knew it was way bigger than I wanted it to be. So we ended up cutting it in half. Um, so the first book ends up, um, being about, and then we've expanded on them. The first book ended up being retitled the, uh, the Crystal Pond. And then the second book has the original title, The Ivory Queen. And that's gone on. And both of them are now over 300 pages. The Ivory Queen is close to 400 pages. Um, so they've, they've kind of evolved over time and become their own entities um, as the stories expanded. You mentioned the word we a few times. Is your ah, <laughs> I have an editor. Oh, uh, wonderful. So I, I love shout outs to editors. And, and Phil had a, a shout out. Please, please tell me a little bit about your work there because that's okay. So yeah, my, my editor is Sophia Kelly Schultz. Um, she also does writing. So I work editing her work. She works at editing mine. So when I say we, it's been like the, the story was there, but working with her has made it so much richer. Um, and just, you know, she's pointed out problems that the story had and we've hammered through them to make them work a lot more, uh, a lot more effectively. So I can't say enough about having a good editor to make the story better and to make it work clearly. And I see him nodding. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, the and, editor is and, critical. And it, it sounds like you have an interesting relationship with her that you're also on the giving end of that as well for her work. Right. Well, as an English teacher, it's good to have my eyes to look at hers. And it, so it works very well. And when we started working on these projects, she's like, I'm going to want you to look at mine, too. And I said, yeah, so we're still we're kind of tossing around the idea of starting an editing company. And uh, when I retire and when she fully retires. So, wow. Yes. You know, you, you, you and Phil are so right that, you know, what you write. And this is so important for all of our aspiring writers to hear is not the finished product. So don't either beat yourself up over it, but also don't, you know, publish it. <laughs> like, you know, like, like that's not the end of the story. There's so much more depth and richness and, and wonderful things in the hands of the right person who can help you and guide you mm -hmm. and, and help you to see things. So I, I really so appreciate you, you both saying that because you're really kind of giving a lot of permission to people by saying that. You know, people see writers like yourselves and think, I could never do that. I wrote this and it's not great. And and for you to say that is really so helpful to them. It really is. Um, you also have a female protagonist. Were you? Yes. What, what was your uh, read on that? I'm guessing different than Phil's. Um, and at the time I was writing it, um, and yeah, I can kind of trace a lot of the characters back to people I grew up with. Um, we kind of was taking the story and saying, okay, what would I do if this happened this way? 
and kind of took it and ran with it. And as I said, there's a lot of people that I can go, okay, this was based on this person, this was based on that person. Um, and they've all grown up and they're totally different than their characters were in the story, of course, but they, you know, I'm still in touch with a lot of them. So they were pretty excited when they heard, oh yeah, the book got, the book got published, oh, this is great. You know, um, and one of my oldest friends who we're gonna be friends 40 years this year um, is a prominent character or had a character in there that was one of the prominent characters. Fantastic. So, yeah. Now I have to ask you as an English teacher, you know, Phil got a little ruined from reading books now that he just, you know, re reads with a critical eye. I, I'm worried about you as an English teacher. Can you just read for enjoyment or do you sit there? Oh, and I do. <laughs> yeah, I do. I'm actually doing a, a, a summer competition through um, one of the, one of the fantasy, the independent fantasy addicts website. Um, so a Facebook page and we're doing a summer read of independent authors and I actually just got through one and she'd reviewed my book and now I'm going to do the review for hers. So I still go through it. My biggest problem with that is that I see the, I see any egregious <laughs> problems and I immediately notice it and fix on it. You know, it's like you misspelled one thing. I'm going to I'll let them know because I think it's always good to let somebody know when there's a mistake. Um, but that doesn't ruin the story for me uh, unless it's like all over the place in concert. <laughs> Good oh. for you because I can sometimes not even watch TV because the, even the news headlines have issues with them. <laughs> Say, you had one sentence, just one sentence you had to put out there. <laughs> and I'm not an English teacher. I can't imagine how you feel. It's it's hard. It's hard. But for the most part, if I catch it, I just send, hey, little blip to you. This you might want to fix it. Um, but other than that, you know, it's, it's been fine. I have no problem reading it, you know, other than noticing egregious plot holes or things to that nature. So good for you. Now, how about your own writing? You're, you're one, two, and now you're up to three. Is it going easier, smoother? Is it harder? What, how's your so, evolution as a writer? Yeah. Book three is in outline form right now. I just got done with the school year. So I'm going to be starting to tackle that. I've been discussing it with my friend who I edit with. Um, and we'll be diving into that. I know I'll be diving into that. I can't say we for this because I've got to write this, She's not writing it with me, um, but I'll be diving into that in the next couple of weeks and really seeing what I can do with it. I have what I call test trenches already written of it. Um, and some of that I'm going to keep and some of that I'm going to ditch and then I'm going to see how it all stitches together and start going from there. Um, but, you know, it's, it's going along with the, the, the first book really does set the scenes up. So the Crystal Pond really gets everything rolling. You get to meet some of the main characters. You're, you know, the protagonist, Deirdre, does get to start getting a sense of all of the betrayal that's going on in the kingdom and the, the fact that there's so much undercutting of the authority of the ruling body that, that uh, is being done by several of the, uh, the very trusted administration. So there's that going on and she has to try and figure out how to find the dragons when it seems like nobody really wants to help her get there. Um, the second book moves further, gets across the southern desert, finds the dragons, but then they get back and they find they've got another problem on their hands that they weren't expecting. Uh, so it just, the third book is hopefully going to be wrapping all of this up. I, I, I was going to ask, when you said, hopefully, you took the words right out of my mouth. Um, will they discover that there's a book four? <laughs> they, there's thought, so we're not sure. Right now, I'm looking to see how long this is going to get us through. I don't want the book to be 400, 500 pages long. Uh, so it really is all gonna depend on how much the story gets where it's supposed to be and if it finishes itself. I do love what you, you just commented that you're a teacher, and when the school year ends, you know, next week or whenever it does, then you can put your mind to this. That really is so helpful because some, I think people are a little worried that they can't compartmentalize their writing like that. Like mm -hmm. if I don't just write, write this minute and just quit my job and write this now, but, but you can actually put it into your life. Most of the time, um, I will tell you that not this past January, but the January before I got seized by the muse. So ah. to speak, you know, if you know the seizing by the muse and got dragged into writing an entirely separate novel that we're editing and working on. 
um, that has nothing to do with this and it's urban fantasy. And I don't know where it came from. I don't know how it started. It's, I had a dream one night and I woke up and I said, I got to write. And then the next thing I know I'm a hundred pages in. I'm like, okay, this is, I don't know what happened, but uh, fortunately I was working from home at that time. So I had a little more flexibility. I don't think I could do it now, now that I'm back in school. That's hilarious. So it does happen. It happens to the best of us. Well, <laughs> thank you so much. And for all of our viewers, The Crystal Pawn um, by Deborah Jarvis. Uh, get her get started reading because book two is already out there and book three is on the way. Our third guest today, Lindsay Kinsella, is the author of The Lazarus Taxa. And our author writes, 68 million years in the past. Deep time, the true final frontier. But all is not as it seems. Which should be feared most? The dinosaurs or the people? The Lazarus Taxa follows the first scientific expedition through time to the late Cretaceous, where a dark conspiracy soon begins to unravel. Please welcome author Lindsay Kinsella. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. And where are you reading from today? <laughs> I am coming from across the pond. I am in Scotland. Ah, I, I, I was hoping that uh, wonderful brogue there wasn't just a transplant into America. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it sounds like you guys are having much warmer weather than we are. Oh, yes. What is it like in Scotland right about now? It's, it's actually quite warm for us. But it's probably still cold for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know the Fahrenheit scale. It's, it's about low 20s in Celsius. Ooh, ooh, that is chilly. That is chilly. <laughs> Even I can do that conversion in my head. Where in Scotland? Is it ever going to get warm for you this summer or not really? No, no. This is this is a hot summer day. Um, I'm wearing shorts right now. So, um, yeah, I'm not acclimatized to hot weather at all. <laughs> So he definitely is not going to be visiting Phil Asmundson after the show is no. over, that's for sure. <laughs> I, I may. I, I will just, you know, shrivel up and die. He'll shrivel up and die and he'll be eating <laughs> ice cubes. That's what he'll be doing. <laughs> I think Phil will have to visit you and, and just wear a sweater. That's what I think. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about the inspiration. I mean, 68 million years in the past. How do you get inspired to start that? So I, I think for, for as long as I can remember, really, I've been a huge um, kind of paleontology geek. <laughs> and I, I think for the majority of my life, I felt the need for some sort of creative outlet on that, particularly as popular media broadly either ignores or misrepresents the subject. So I, I really wanted a, a creative outlet that would would show the more interesting sides of, of that particular science and show that there's more to it than what we see in in movies and on TV and, and show these animals as as real animals in their native environment and just kind of kick out a lot of the the old kind of outdated dinosaur tropes that we have these days. Um, so that was the basis for it and I just kind of went down the wormhole and, and it soon became a full novel and I don't think I even really expected that myself. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about the science behind this, like research, when you're writing something, you know, certainly none of us actually know, I mean, maybe you do, but <laughs> what, what went on, but you also have to write, even though it's fiction, of course, in a way that it is believable. How do you manage that on something that is so, so 68 million years in the past? Um. It's, it's difficult. It's difficult. Um, I think that the benefit I had is that, you know, like I say, it's something that's you know fascinated me for my, my entire life. So I really, in, in a way, without knowing it, I started researching this book, you know, 20 years before I even decided to write it. Um, but yeah, certainly there is a lot of research that, that has to go into it. Um, but I, I think actually the, the most difficult balance to strike isn't necessarily keeping it realistic. It's make sure that you have it be, you know, believable. Mm. Also have that dramatic element and, and keep it exciting at the same time yes. without falling out of the trap of it just becoming ridiculous. Yeah, um, exactly. You, you don't want to uh, get to a point that a paleontologist would say, oh, stop. You know? <laughs> we want exactly. to be by the story here. 
Yeah, and and I think that's that's why it, it really the story goes down the the route of you, you know the, the the real the real villains of the story are are people and you know that to me is quite believable. But you know there are uh, the, the approach I took is that if for the purpose of you know the drama something really must be not entirely realistic it at least has to be in a way that hasn't been done already. Um, I, personally don't mind watching some sort of science fiction where it's not 100% real, I get it but it frustrates me when it's unrealistic in the same way I've seen a hundred times before and sometimes there's a someone described it to me recently as a, as a small lie to tell a larger truth <laughs> uh, you kind of you kind of bend the details in order to to portray that there's a larger variety and and a, you know there's a bigger science behind it than, than we might have seen so um you know there there are some you know large feathered dinosaurs which maybe that specific species we don't have evidence for but we know there were others like it that were so there's there's a little bit of speculation but for that kind of grander truth if that makes sense that makes perfect sense. You said yourself when you started this, you didn't expect it to become a whole novel. What did you think you were writing? A short story, uh, uh, you know, uh, at the back of a book? What, what did you think you were going to come up with here? I, I don't actually think I gave that all that much thought. If <laughs> I'm, um, kind of similarly to, to Deborah, I suppose. I, I was very much a, a lockdown writer. Ah. And, and I think... I just kind of figured it would be something that would sit on my hard drive forever. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I don't think I had the, the confidence that it was good enough hmm. to, to be a book until, you know, maybe a year and a half into writing it where I started to think, maybe this is okay. Um, but yeah, I, I think like, like um, both Phil and Ebra said, um, an editor made all the difference. Um, uh, I, I really, I really resonated with when Phil said he, he got it back from an editor and realised he, he had no idea how to write a book. <laughs> that's entirely true, um, which I, I think is why that's the best piece of advice that any new writer can get sent it to an editor because um, you don't, I still don't, if I'm honest. Um, I, I write a story and then I give it to an editor to make it into a book. There's, there's quite a considerable difference between those two things, I think. But then suddenly once I had this edited book back and I was like, yeah, this is quite good now. <laughs> um, I love that. I could just picture you getting it back and reading it saying, wow, I like this. And then saying, I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's, that's exactly it. It's, it's, it really did transform it. And yeah, it's, it's funny. I, I didn't really set out with, with necessarily the ambition to be a writer, at least not at first. Right. It was just kind of killing time almost. <laughs> now, you know, I'm I'm working on another book now. I've kind of I got was the gonna ask now. you that. Did you get the bug? Are you working on something else? I did a hundred percent and I now have I, I now have you know notes and concepts and ideas for probably about 50 other books. I'll never be able to write them all. <laughs> um, maybe maybe my children will finish them off for me one day. But um yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm down the rabbit hole now. Wow, it happened. You were bitten by the bug. 50 books. Well, you know, James Patterson, you can knock him out every couple of months just like that. <laughs> <laughs> How has your process evolved? This was your first time down this rabbit hole. Did you know what you were doing? Did you just kind of go with the flow? You know, what, what are you doing differently this time around? I know that's like a million questions, but bring us, you know, bring us back because I love talking to someone who's a newbie because you're so fresh. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm definitely still trying to pin down what my process is. Um, the, the first, the, the Lazarus taxa was, was very much, I think the term is to pants it, um, very much just kind of made it up as it went along. I didn't know how it was going to end when I began writing it. Um, the downside to that is it meant it required many rewrites because I was on about the fourth draft and I decided that I didn't like how it ended and wanted to completely change it. And then because I didn't plan it out beforehand, it definitely took considerably longer than it would have done otherwise. My current book, I've certainly plotted a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that structure is there. Um, 
but I, I find that the, what I found otherwise is, is, is some of the some of the soul, some of the the kind of emotion and the believability and the character driven nature of it that then suffers. So then I find that there's there's rewrites there to 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 go back and you know kind of allow the characters to to go off you know off the path a little. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm still trying to establish what what my process is, and I think realistically it's going to be somewhere in between those two that I'll say along. Yeah. No, that makes perfect sense. And now you said you have just, you know, 50 different ideas for the next one. Where do you get your ideas from? You know, when you said, do you just dream them? Are you, you know, 50, having that many ideas at once, isn't it amazing? But people it, ask, where do you get ideas? I, I really don't know. Um, it's, it's I, I think I'm a daydreamer. Um, which isn't always a good thing, but uh, usually I, I get my ideas. You know, I'll be halfway through the di through doing dishes, and I'll, I'll have to I'll have to stop and dry my hands and go take some notes so that I don't forget. You know, a good idea I've just had. Um, you know, ideas and, and bringing them together into a book are obviously wholly different things to do. Oh, absolutely. But, yeah, I, I just um, I, I just my mind wanders. Um, not always. At the best of moments, sometimes when I be concentrating, but that's, that's just how it works sometimes. I love that. I love that. Uh, for all of our writers out here, um, we're all kind of in that uh, fantasy, sci fi, it's not believable. What if you were going to write something in a totally different genre? I don't know. Is that even possible? Phil, if you were going to write something that was completely different, what would it be? Well, um, I've already, it sounds like, uh, certainly like Lindsay, and I'm sure Deborah's got a whole bunch of ideas in the bank there too. And, and uh, um, I tend to write a book for a purpose. And, and as I said, it was all about young women getting in more involved in science. Uh, I've actually outlined two books, one of which is, is about halfway done. And, and um, I don't know the name of it yet. I've thought of a whole bunch. The one that probably sticks in my mind the most is called The Deadliest Weapon. And it's about the weaponization of social media. Um, I, I did a lot of research on social media in my job and we looked at the good and the bad of it all. And there's a lot of good, but there's also an awful lot of bad involved in it. And it's starting to come out a little bit more uh, as to the, the detrimental effects it has on young people. And, and so Deborah, you, you'd probably be able to see some of that as well. Mm -hmm. Screen time is ridiculously high just on social media. They oh, yeah. the blurring between reality and, and, and fantasy. Um, and so that's one of the books. The other one, um, I, I know the name for this one. It's called Breakfast with an Empty Chair because I had the epiphany when I was sitting down in the Caribbean. I was about to make a keynote speech at a conference and I was sitting there at breakfast by myself. And I happened to look at this empty chair across from me and I said, you know, what does that symbolize? It symbolizes a lot of things. Loneliness, you know, uh, having um, so my wife trying to call me. I told her not to. Sorry about that. <laughs> but um, uh, it it ended up being a book about a CEO that notices this chair when he's when he's in a restaurant one time, and it's different from every other chair in there. And he goes and he looks, and there's an old newspaper clipping there, and that newspaper clipping is about a competitor he ends up buying, and it's really about he's slipping into insanity. And you know, mental health is another big issue I feel strongly about that we don't do enough on. And so we all have a stigma around mental health that, oh, it can't happen to me. Well, this is a CEO who had been uh, twice named CEO of the year, and yet he is slipping into the mental illness side of things. And it's about uh, what the company tries to do to help him, but that, that person trying to help him um, may or may not be real. So it might still exist in his mind. That one I don't have quite as far along. I've kind of written the opening chapter and the ending chapter. <laughs> the other one, I, I, I uh, have, have, have probably about halfway through it now. And I do a lot of research for all of these. I mean, I, I probably had, for the Tower Tones books, I probably had, if you stacked all the papers up, about two and a half feet of uh, uh, <laughs> poor paper. I've killed too many trees doing this. Um, <laughs> because I want to be factually correct. I want to use real facts in all of my books so that if someone, uh, I tried to put footnotes in my book and my editor looked at me and said, absolutely not. 
And I said, well, I just want people, absolutely not. You break their, you know, concentration on reading the book, get those things out of there. <laughs> so those are my two. And those would be more of, um, certainly the deadliest weapon is more of an adventure, you know, kind yeah, of thriller. Yeah. And the other one just is really a, a, a sad story of someone who nobody suspected. And by the time they finally figured out there was a problem, it was too late. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so you are going to blur those lines. Deborah, how about you? Uh, do you have a, another genre that you would like to try or have you already? So um, aside from the urban fantasy, which is still fantasy, there's a, another book that I've been working on since grad school. And it's more along the lines of the Da Vinci Code. But one of the things that drove me absolutely batty about the Da Vinci Code and Angels and Demons is he took the information that was out there and he changed it to suit the story. And that absolutely makes me mental. Uh, it's like, please work with what exists. Don't change it for your own purposes. So, um, and you may know Lindsay, we, we actually had ended up in Scotland and we went to uh, Roslyn Chapel and there is no secret place down underneath the floor. Uh, and they were talking about it when we were when we were at the chapel and just found that that was uh, it's like, OK, so he totally just took this and ran with it and did what he wanted. So the, the book that I've been working on since grad school is called Forever Demand. Um, and this one does have a fantasy element to it, but it's more about the, the history of a monastery and uh, a character who exists through time from about the 900s to uh, present day and has been part and parcel through some time periods that have gone along and just looking at some of those, some of the cool discoveries in the world, uh, including the, the, the cities of Nineveh and Nimrud and uh, the loss of the Amber Room and some other uh, things that have occurred during time. So just some, wow. really, some really fun explorations into, into history. Um, and a friend of mine went over, and I went over to Rome and actually went to the places that I'd, I'd already written so much of um, we got a chance to go over to Rome and actually explore some of the places that I wrote about just what I'd seen through photos. So that was pretty exciting. Um, so that does kind of blur the lines into kind of a mystery. Oh, absolutely. More, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 you know, more historical too, you know, yes. what's going on there. And uh, now I know I not, should not bother to travel to Roslyn Chapel, should I? <laughs> well, it's totally worth the trip still. And it's wonderful and it's beautiful. Uh, we totally enjoyed our time there. Uh, they did a wonderful presentation talking about the history of it. And it really, one of the things that Dan Brown did do for it is it allowed, the, the travel there allowed for the renovations that were so desperately needed to oh, the chapel. So I would not say don't go there. I'm just saying don't go there expecting there to be something that's that's not. So. Don't go there and then knock on every door and pick up every rug and look for the secret door. Right, right. It's not there, it's but not it's there. totally worth the It's totally worth the trip. Yeah. Well, it's definitely going to Scotland is definitely on my hit list. That's for sure. Uh, Lindsay, how about you? Uh, different um, genre, fifty ideas. I'm sure you've got all sorts of genres in there. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think the Lazarus Tax definitely falls into the science fiction category. Um, my current work in progress is very much fantasy, so I've, I've sort of genre hopped already. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really want to delve into horror after this, to be okay. honest. I, I, I grew up reading horror. Um, I, I grew up reading Stephen King, probably at an age that was too young to be reading Stephen King, if I'm entirely honest. Um, and that's, that's where my, my kind of love of books stemmed. So I'd, I'd quite like to write one or two horror novels. I Ooh. think that would, be, that would be interesting. Ooh, I am even too scared to sometimes read them. So good for you. I, <laughs> writing that is definitely a huge, huge change. And we'll have to have you back on the show when we've got some horror. For all of you, if you could please describe who should be buying your book. Now, of course, everybody. But besides that, if I'm looking at my gift list right now, who should I grab a copy of your book? Uh, Deborah, would you start us off? If I'm going sure. shopping right now and I'm thinking about the Crystal Pawn, who should I buy a copy of the Crystal Pawn for? Um, so I'm, it's kind of hard to say. I've had a lot of people of different age groups really like it. Um, it is kind of an older style fantasy more because it was originally conceived in the 80s. So it's not it's not as as action packed as some. Um, and it is one of the one of the stories that I would say I can recommend to teenagers to read because it, it doesn't have scenes in it that would 
um, potentially upset parents. Uh, it's pretty it's pretty laid back that way, but there is enough action in there to satisfy you know any fantasy reader, um, especially the build up of the characters. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that, especially for uh, readers or parents who are concerned about it. Thank you so much. Uh, Lindsay, who should I be buying a copy of The Lazarus Taxa for today? I, I think anyone who, who has a, a, an interest in, in science of, of any kind, really, I think I really delve quite deeply into the science. And I, and I hope that a reader kind of learns a thing or two about the book as well. Um, but yeah. Everyone loves dinosaurs, don't they? <laughs> well, I certainly love dinosaurs, but I'm I, I'm jaded. I'm living in New York and you know grew up in the Museum of Natural History in the dinosaur wing, so I'm all for it. That is that is on my bucket list of places to visit. Okay, so you and I'll have to do a swap. You're going to show me around Scotland, and I'll show you around the dinosaur wing. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> that's a deal you're on absolutely it's a deal and and philip who should i be buying a copy of uh the four forces for uh, you know i i thought long and hard when i was writing this too I, I i kept it pretty much pg um in fact i thought i had no swear words in there and i had a young book club read it and i got a funny note that said oh you know my my 11 year old daughter came in and said i found a bad word in this book and <laughs> It, it turned out to be the S word, uh, but, uh, uh, and I thought I'd cleaned it all up and they just laughed and said it was hysterical, but she said, but it's okay, it's a really good story. <laughs> um, so I wrote it at kind of the, the, the audience that would be uh, uh, A, interested in science and B, kind of like a Harry Potter. This is a real, you know, fantasy adventure. Um, even though it's our world, it's an entirely different world than we think about as we walk through life every single day. And um, I find that you know, I've heard from many people, they just can't look at a sunrise anymore the same way. And, mm -hmm. and they now know why sunsets are red and yellow and orange. And uh, uh, because you're gonna learn all those things in there. And, and so it's, it's kind of the, 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 you know, the, the um, you know, Harry Potter type of crowd, you know, that, that type that just wants to find a, a discover a new world. And in this case, it just happens to be their own. And Lindsay, you'll be happy to know this, this uh, first book, the prologue, uh, opens up 65 million years ago oh. <laughs> with, with the KT event that, that killed the dinosaurs. And it was that impact from, from a distant star that had exploded in my story that, you know, um, um, 62 million years ago, because they, they, they've been on Earth for 3 million years, uh, came because it had something that they needed to sustain their environment. Ah, oh. and so we're, we're I'm, I'm, I didn't quite go back as far as you, but uh, mine does start with an event that uh, historically is believed to have been the, the, what, what, what killed the dinosaurs. Well, I adore hearing how much research obviously went into these books because uh, as, a, as a lover of reading, but also as a mom who might be looking for books for the young people in my life, it's so good to know that the author actually knows the answer which is just fabulous. <laughs> uh, one final question, because they say that 90% of the population wants to write a book, yet at least here in America, only about this percentage actually do. You three represent success. So any tips for our writers out there? Lindsay, let's start with you today. What would you tell to a, an aspiring writer to get started? I, I think that the the first, the first tip is is not to be disheartened when your first draft sucks, <laughs> because it will, it will, everyone's does, um, but just be aware that everyone's does. Um, that doesn't mean you should give up, keep at it. Because I think that I certainly considered giving up after the first draft, um, and I'm glad I didn't. Awesome, thank you, Phil. How about you? What would you say to our aspiring writers out there? You know, I would echo exactly what Lindsay said. I mean, your, your, your first draft is going to be horrible. And, um, but, you know, really go into it with a positive attitude. Everyone has a story they want to tell. And um, part of the trick is finding. And uh, in my case, I just, I probably read, I'm going to say over a hundred myths until I found a myth I wanted to, to uh, you know, set this story on. And, and it led me to all sorts of other things. I started, uh, I, I now know an awful lot more about our Native American uh, uh, friends. And um, I had the opportunity to meet with them to discuss their heritage, some of their beliefs. And 
because um, one of the characters in there is from the Native American um, community. And uh, I picked him to be in that story because it was the Native Americans in my story that originally had a relationship with the Tarotons because they were most like the Tarotons uh, in that their wisdom and their way of thinking was very different than the rest of us in the United States. And um, I actually found that to be true as, as I got to know more and more of them. And I, I still, to this day, am, am uh, awed by the fact that I collect a Native American art and rugs now. So I have them all over my house. So it, 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 it had a fundamental change, but just, just, just find that story and you'll find, you'll write it. It won't be very good at first, but then you'll find people to help you make it better. Thank you. And Deborah, what would you, what would you say to our aspiring writers out there? Well, certainly if you write a story and you put it away for a while, don't give up on ever publishing it because, you know, mine sat for quite some time um, until I was able to get to it. But, you know, don't give up on the dream, you know, just keep going with it. Uh, it's worth the fight. The story is important. And I think, the, you know, you'll reach the audience that it's meant for uh, when the time is right. So getting the word out there, knowing your stuff and, and definitely with the research, I can't, I can't say that that is, you know, that, that is 100% true. That is 100% true. Um, for me, a lot of my writing has mythological background, not Native American, but usually uh, with Kirillismus is a lot of Greco-Roman, um, you know, nuance to some of the storytelling, you know, so do your research, don't give up on getting it published, um, and don't, don't stop, you know, keep going. Fantastic. Thank you. And thank you to all three of you. Um, I, we wish you so much success with not just the book we talked about, but all of the books to come. And thank you for your words of inspiration for our writers. For all of our readers, I hope you grab a copy. They sound amazing. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us on Between the Covers. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're an author who would be interested in appearing on our show, or perhaps you're a member of a book club, we do host book clubs as well, please visit BetweenTheCoversTV.com. By the way, at BetweenTheCoversTV.com, you can watch past episodes in addition to learning more about our authors and guests. So sign up there if you would like to be a guest on the show yourself. And if you have some books that you would like to get written or published, visit redpenguinbooks.com. Thanks so much for joining us.